welcome, dear listener, to Episode 7, Remastered. Here, I'll explore the cell and the basics of cellular function and physiology. This episode, and this entire series on the cell, will build off of the knowledge that you acquired from Season 1, and will zoom out to see how all of these biochemicals work together to form a living cell. When compared to molecules, cells are massive. An enormous bubble of phospholipids studded with proteins forms the cellular membrane, while many more proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids are packed into the cell itself. Now there's two major types of cells, two major domains, which I first referenced in episode one. These two domains are called eukaryotes and prokaryotes. The eukaryotes include humans, and fish, and your pet dog, and birch trees, and pretty much all of the macroscopic organisms that you see around you. Prokaryotes are very small, single-celled organisms, bacteria and archaea. It's currently accepted that the first protocells that ever existed evolved into prokaryotes, which gradually became more sophisticated and more complex until the eukaryote lineage emerged and then branched off and diverged on its own sometime later. Now, this chronological series of events is logical, as eukaryotes are both larger and far more complicated than prokaryotes. However, it should be understood that the issue is far from settled. We really aren't sure what the first cells were like. There's a lot of competing hypotheses, and there's a lot of data that paints a very complicated, nuanced picture but we just aren't 100% sure. The primary physical differences that exist between eukaryotes and prokaryotes are pretty well understood, and these include their internal organization of uh, structures and the method of their DNA storage. Prokaryotes, for example, keep their DNA in the shape of a large loop, free-floating in the cytoplasm. In fact, everything in the prokaryote floats in the cytoplasm, because they don't possess internal membrane-bound compartments called organelles. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, keep their DNA inside of a nucleus. Eukaryotes also have numerous organelles, which are little membrane-bound internal compartments that hold specific chemicals or that perform certain functions. To start things off, I'm going to explain the structures that are shared between both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. All cells have a plasma membrane. This is a very important lipid bilayer membrane. This membrane is studded on both sides with a huge collection of proteins and glycoproteins and other types of molecular structures. Together, these proteins coating the inner and outer surfaces of the membrane work to strictly regulate what does and does not enter the cell. In this way, the membrane creates a hard division in space between what's alive and what's not alive. What's on the outside of the membrane is the, the non-living external world, and that which is encapsulated by the cellular membrane, like all the enzymatic machinery and the biomolecules and ions flowing along their gradients, this is what composes living matter. Now, all cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes included, have cytoskeletons of some kind. A cytoskeleton is basically a thin framework that helps the cell keep its shape. The cytoskeleton is usually composed of a lot of thin filaments, like fibers or coiled tubes, that are all knotted and layered together. They're layered all across the inner surface of the membrane, and they even reach across the cytoplasm to physically connect the internal sides of the cell. The cytoskeleton provides a measure of stability and consistent structure to the otherwise fluid and amorphous membrane. In prokaryotes, diffusion can move most nutrients and resources through the cytoplasm pretty quickly. But in larger eukaryotic cells, diffusion is a little less effective. So you have proteins and protein complexes that have to be used to move stuff around inside of the cell. These proteins moving within the cell use these filaments that crisscross the cytoplasm like a series of three-dimensional roads, or bridges, to move stuff from one region to another inside of the cell. In both of the major domains, there are some subtypes of cells that have a cell wall. Prokaryotic bacteria and eukaryotic plants both have this cell wall feature, 
which is composed of a type of carbohydrate, or in some cases, a polysaccharide, that's deposited on the outside of the membrane. However it's formed and whatever it's made of, this cell wall is rigid. It provides the structural integrity and mechanical protection that the cell needs. When the solute concentration of the cell is very high, water will come into the cell through osmosis, and this will cause the cell to swell and expand. In extreme cases, the cell will explode and burst its guts out into the extracellular matrix. The cell wall is a defensive measure that protects against this. Its rigid encapsulating structure prevents the membrane from swelling past a particular size. The pressure within a prokaryotic bacteria, for example, is nearly the same as the pressure in a car tire. Some prokaryotes also share with plants the capacity for photosynthesis. The chemical process of capturing the energy in sunlight, I think it was one of the first major evolutionary things ever to appear in the history of life. And so as a result, a lot of these early prokaryotic species are photosynthetic. They produce sugars through the enzyme-dependent processes of photosynthesis. All cells also have genetic material, or DNA, which they reproduce during cellular division so that each of their daughter cells has its own copy of the parent genome. If you recall from the first episode, you might recognize a lot of this material from the formal requirements for life, or from cell theory. Other parts of cell theory discuss reproduction of both DNA and the cells and the organisms themselves. Every prokaryote species is unicellular and reproduces asexually. They divide themselves to produce two daughter cells. Now some eukaryote species are unicellular, but there's also a lot of eukaryote species that are multicellular, and these can reproduce asexually or sexually, respectively. Sexual reproduction involves the combining of two individuals' gametes into a new genome. Now, every species has DNA. These long strands of nucleic acids coil together, tightly, into a supercoiled, rope-like structure called a chromosome. In both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, chromosomes are also composed of proteins, which help to organize the coiling and the packing of the DNA strands. Now, despite all these similarities, the actual structure and location of the chromosomes within the cell differs between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Okay, now that I've covered some of the similarities between all cells, I'm going to discuss the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Now, perhaps the most striking difference is their size. Prokaryotic cells are much, much smaller than eukaryotic cells, so much so that eukaryotic cells often entirely consume prokaryotic cells as a manner of lunch. The small size of the prokaryotic cell gives it a larger surface-to-volume ratio. In biology, a critically important rule that you should always keep in mind is that form implies function. The function of a molecule, or a cell, or an organ, or a limb on a macroscopic organism is dependent or heavily influenced on its structure. In this case, the larger surface area to volume ratio allows prokaryotes to absorb chemical resources through its membrane at a faster rate relative to its metabolism and growth. It's no surprise, then, that prokaryotes have a higher metabolic and growth rate than eukaryotes. Now what about the structure and the organization of the chromosome in the prokaryotic cell? The DNA takes the shape of a giant loop, free-floating in the cytoplasm alongside all of the other internal contents of the cell. The chromosome forms when this loop begins to coil and pile back in on itself to form a loose clump that floats somewhere within the cell. The general location of this tangled mess of DNA within the prokaryotic cell is called the nucleoid. Particular segments of the chromosome can loop out and become a little bit looser. These loose loop sections, they're, they're selectively decompressed, and so this allows proteins and enzymes to access the DNA strand there and begin transcribing those particular genes. It's a method of regulation for gene expression. Besides the nucleoid, prokaryotes like bacteria can keep genetic information in much smaller loops of supercoiled DNA called plasmids. The plasmids provide genes that help the prokaryote react to rapid shifts in its chemical environment, like a sudden change in temperature 
or acidity. Prokaryotes can also do something really amazing called horizontal gene transfer, where one or more genes in the form of these plasmids can be replicated in one cell and then transferred to another cell through one of three processes. Bacteriophage-mediated transduction, plasmid-mediated conjugation, and natural transformation. In transduction, a virus-like bacteriophage will pick up genes from one bacteria, and when it goes to infect another cell, it'll carry those genes with it and deposit them in this other cell. In conjugation, the two cells will physically touch, either through membrane contact or through a thin bridge that extends out from their membranes, which connects and forms a little tunnel through which they share genetic information. They share these plasmids. This is kind of like bacteria sex, or at least it's the closest thing to it. Now the third process of horizontal gene transfer, transformation, is where the cell will absorb a free-floating piece of genetic material and simply incorporate it into its own genome. The reason why horizontal gene transfer is so incredible and amazing, but also frustrating, is because it represents a case where genetic information is not passed linearly. It makes it difficult to elucidate the evolutionary histories and lineages that exist in these bacteria and archaea domains, because all of this DNA has just been scrambled together from hundreds of millions of years of horizontal gene transfer. It's totally muddied the waters, and it's made elucidating the origin of some of these genes extremely difficult. A few minutes ago, I mentioned cell walls. All but two genera of prokaryotes have a cell wall, which is a stiff sheet that wraps around the membrane. Now, of the two domains of prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, one of the major differences between them is the composition of their cell walls. These cell walls come in a variety of different shapes and compositions, which can be helpful in organizing and classifying species. Bacteria and archaea can be spherical, pyramidal, or cone-like, rod-shaped, or in the form of a short helix or a spiral. They can take all manner of forms. It's pretty incredible. But whatever form they take, bacterial cell walls are composed of the carbohydrate peptidoglycan. Some bacteria have thick, heavy peptidoglycan shells, which stain a dark purple under the Gram stain test. When seen through a microscope, bacteria that have these thick cell walls that have been stained heavily with the Gram staining, they appear as very dark purple blobs. These bacteria are Gram positive, denoting the thick layer of sugars coating the membrane. Gram negative bacteria, in contrast, have thin cell walls that stain lightly under the Gram stain test. Under a microscope, Gram-negative bacteria appear as a very pale purple, or a barely visible pink. This is because they simply don't have enough peptidoglycan to be stained by this dye, so they just don't show up. Now as for archaea, there's four types of archaean cell walls, and each one is composed of a different material. The first type is pseudopeptidoglycan, which, as its name suggests, is similar to peptidoglycan, but it has a beta-1,3 linkage instead of a beta-1,4 linkage that's found in the normal peptidoglycan. The second type is composed of a mixture of glycoproteins and methanogens. The third type is a one-layer film of proteins, called an S-layer. The fourth type of cell wall is actually pretty poorly understood, but what is known about it is that it's composed of a thick layer of polysaccharides, so sugars. Furthermore, prokaryotes often have an array of molecular structures that protrude from their membranes. Many bacteria have flagella, which are long string-like structures with a corkscrew shape. Enzymatic engines reside in and underneath the membrane, and they're able to rotate the base of the flagella, which cause it to spin. This spinning of the flagella will propel the prokaryote through the water at a speed that's much faster than any fish can go, relative to the size of their body. Some bacteria species also possess numerous needle structures protruding out from all over their membrane. These needle structures are called fimbria, and bacteria use them as a kind of anchor, or like Velcro, when they get stuck in some soft tissue in a larger organism, 
they literally stab into the membranes of other cells, and that helps the, the bacterial particle stay embedded in the tissue. Many infectious bacteria owe their persistence to the fimbria, which make them stick to the host cells where they are really difficult to remove. Okay, so that about covers the unique characteristics of prokaryotes. Now recall how much larger eukaryotes are than prokaryotes. The large size gives eukaryotes a lower surface area to volume ratio. They have a slower metabolism, and they take longer to grow and to reproduce. But they also have a greater level of internal organization, which promotes the efficient use of resources and allows for a greater degree of functional variation. Eukaryotes maintain this internal organization with a number of organelles, which are internal compartments, or membrane-bound bubbles, within the cell itself. The compartmentalization will also increase the effectiveness of diffusion. Diffusion is less effective as a method of transport over long distances, like the full length of a eukaryotic cell. But by breaking up their internal space into smaller compartments, the effectiveness of diffusion increases, as each small compartment can be easily and rapidly filled and just move on to the next one. Resources can be distributed via diffusion throughout the compartment much faster than they could be through the whole cell. The bubble compartments can also create isolated chemical environments. One compartment can isolate the synthesis of a particular biomolecule, while another compartment might contain caustic chemicals that break down and recycle that biomolecule, so it's important to keep them separate. Furthermore, by isolating these chemical environments, compartmentalization also purifies the environments. Necessary chemicals can be held in high concentrations, or only created in that particular compartment. Necessary molecular machinery can be produced locally, and or kept nearby. Nutrients can be easily resupplied through diffusion. I mean, I could go on. The advantages to this are numerous. I've already mentioned the most significant compartment within eukaryotic cells that prokaryotic cells don't have, the nucleus. The nucleus is typically the largest organelle. It's composed of a double bilayer membrane called the nuclear envelope, which is pierced by a collection of highly regulated pores. The nucleus has a cytoskeleton all of its own, composed of protein filaments called nuclear lamina, which line the interior surface and provide structural integrity. Within the nucleus exists the chromosomes and the nucleolus. The nucleolus is a contiguous region, appearing under the microscope like a dark mass. It's here, in the nucleolus, where the ribosomal RNA is synthesized and the subunits are assembled. The chromosomes, on the other hand, are loosely organized. They're unpacked, each one floating in a particular section of the nucleus. During cellular replication, it will condense into supercoiled chromosomes. Surrounding the nucleus is the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER. The ER is a large, flattened organelle, with numerous sacs and tubules and pockets. It's one continuous membrane, but its folds make it appear in transmission electron micrograph photos to look like ripples or droplets surrounding the nucleus. Now the ER is a very busy place. A lot of stuff happens here. The ER can be divided into two distinct groups. You have the rough endoplasmic reticulum, called the rough ER, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or the smooth ER. The difference between them is that the rough ER is covered in ribosomes. These ribosomes give it a studded, gritty appearance, hence the name rough ER. Proteins get constructed by these ribosomes, which eject them into the lumen, or the internal cavity of the rough ER. Here, the proteins can fold themselves properly and get organized according to their destination. You see, the rough ER doesn't just act as a place for proteins to fold safely. It also packages these proteins in smaller compartments, smaller little vesicles, that it buds off of the main membrane. These little budded membranes are given chemical tags, like little markers on the surface, which tell other proteins in the cell where that little membrane vesicle should go. The smooth ER, in contrast, has no ribosomes on it, and thus it appears smooth and clean. The smooth ER is where the cell synthesizes and breaks down lipids. It's also where metabolic byproducts are detoxified, 
and where carbohydrates and steroids go to get metabolized. As you might remember from episode 6, steroids are a form of lipid, and the smooth ER produces various types of steroids. Now when you look at tissues that prioritize steroid production, like the gonads, you find that the cells there are characterized by a significantly higher volume of smooth ER than exists in other cells of other tissue types. This high volume of the smooth ER is necessary for the specialized production of the steroid hormones, like testosterone and estrogen. The smooth ER also produces the phospholipids that are used in your cellular membranes. Without a continual replenishment of these phospholipids, your membranes would just gradually decay and weaken and fall apart. Like the rough ER, the smooth ER also packages its products in little bubbles that bud off from its membrane, and it sends them where they need to go. The rough ER often sends its little membrane packages directly to the Golgi complex, which is another large organelle that acts like a post office for the inside of the cell. The Golgi apparatus is not just one membrane, but instead it's a number of flattened membranes called cisterna that are all layered together. They're all stacked on top of each other like pancakes. So in this pancake stack called the Golgi apparatus, one flat side of it faces the nucleus, while the other flat side faces the cell's main plasma membrane. The side that faces the nucleus is called the cis side, while the side that faces the plasma membrane is called the trans side. The Golgi apparatus receives protein-filled vesicles from the rough ER on the cis side, which are then absorbed into the cisterna and processed. The enzymes inside of the Golgi apparatus are anchored to its membrane, so the bulk of the chemical processing happens along the, the Golgi apparatus's internal surface of its membrane. Now, various cisterna in this Golgi apparatus are responsible for particular acts of protein modification and processing. For example, Cisterna near the cis side, near the nucleus, will help remove a sugar called mannose. Cisterna in the middle will also do that, but they'll also add a monosaccharide tag called N-acetylglucosamine. Cisterna on the trans side will add galactose molecules to the proteins. Now these are all just examples. The Golgi complex is capable of creating a huge variety of modifications to suit just as many of the cell's needs. The proteins are shuttled through the Golgi complex, through each successive layer of cisterna, until they eventually get to the last cisterna, the trans side, where they bud off and float to their destination. Animal cells possess lysosomes. If the Golgi apparatus can be likened to a post office, the lysosomes can be likened to trash recycling plants, or like an incinerator furnace. The inside of the lysosome is a relatively acidic place, containing a solution with a pH around 5. These acidic conditions are maintained by proton pumps, which lower the pH by increasing the concentration of protons, also known as hydrogen ions, that exist within the lysosome solution. These lysosomes are basically little acid bubbles that float around the inside of your cells, and they're a perfect example of the isolating capabilities of a plasma membrane. Old and degraded macromolecules like proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids are all broken down through a series of condensation reactions that they experience when they're dumped into these lysosomes. Eukaryotic cells also have peroxisomes. These are globular or spherical organelles which emerge into the cell as buds coming off of the endoplasmic reticulum. The peroxisomes, as the root word oxy in the name suggests, are responsible for isolating reduction-oxidation reactions, or redox reactions. It's good that the peroxisomes effectively contain these caustic chemical reactions, because the chemicals involved can destroy most other biomolecules. For example, some compounds produced in the peroxisome are used to generate bile acids. These bile acids are part of the digestive system. They allow the body to dissolve and absorb fat-soluble items like lipids and vitamin A. In the leaves of plants, cells possess a type of peroxisome called a glyoxisome. This leaf-dwelling peroxisome oxidizes fat molecules and converts them to an energy storage molecule, like a starch. Seeds, on the other hand, have a different type of peroxisome with a different suite of enzymes. 
these seed-dwelling proxosomes will break down energy-storing molecules to fuel their initial growth. In still other cells, these oxidative enzymes can break down fats and feed the pieces to the mitochondria for them to generate energy. The mitochondria are one of only two types of organelles that exist embedded within eukaryotic cells through an endosymbiotic relationship, the other one being chloroplasts. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts exhibit unusual behavior for an organelle. They have their own genome of bacteria-like DNA that's separate from the genome of the cell itself, and they also divide at their own pace, not in accordance with the division of the cell. These observations led to the formation of the endosymbiosis theory, which posits that mitochondria and chloroplasts were each once free-floating bacteria. At some point in the distant past, eukaryotic cells would have ingested these bacteria, but instead of destroying them, they incorporated them into their own physiology. This would only occur if the bacteria in the cell could benefit from one another. The cell produces the foods needed for the bacteria, and the bacteria produces energy for the cell. The mitochondria really does produce the bulk of the cell's ATP, which is why it's often referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. Eukaryotic cells usually have anywhere from 50 to a million mitochondria per cell, and these produce the chemical energy that's used to power virtually everything that the cell does. Like the nuclear envelope, the mitochondria has two layers. The inner layer of the mitochondria, however, doesn't line the outer layer like it does in the nuclear envelope. The inner layer of the mitochondria has a much higher surface area than the outer layer, and so this inner layer folds back and forth on itself numerous times, filling in the space of the organelle with sheet-like folds and wrinkles. The intermembrane space between the inner and outer membranes forms pockets within these folds, called crustea. A fluid kept within the inner membrane is the mitochondrial matrix. All manner of enzymes sit all along the inner membrane, and a lot more float through the matrix, harvesting energy from food molecules to produce ATP. A typical cell will have enough mitochondria to produce nearly 10 million molecules of ATP a second. Muscle cells produce even more, because they use even more. Plant and algae cells possess both mitochondria and chloroplasts. Now, like mitochondria, the chloroplasts also have an outer and inner membrane. The inner membrane of the chloroplast, however, is not folded into sheets. Instead, the inner membrane is broken up into hundreds of individual disc-like bubbles. These membrane-bound bubbles are very flat, and they stack together like pancakes, separated from the outer membrane by a space called the stroma. Man, I'm just all about the pancake metaphors today. Anyway, each flat bubble in this stroma is called a thylakoid, and the stacks that they form are called grana, or granum. It's within these thylakoids that proteins derive energy from photosynthesis. Enzymes in the stroma use this energy to build sugars, which are then used to grow the plant's tissues. A final type of organelle, called a vacuole, exists in plant and fungal cells. The vacuole is very large. In some cases, it takes up to 80% of the cell's internal space. The vacuole is a storage site for all manner of molecules and ions and nutrients, and because of this high solute concentration, water will flow through osmosis into the vacuole, and this will make it swell, which is why it so often fills up such a big portion of the, of the cell that's hosting it. In the seeds of plants, the vacuole is filled with proteins. These proteins are like giant amino acid conglomerates, which are digested by the young plant for the raw amino acids that it needs to build its own specific proteins. The cells in the shoots, in the stem and the leaves of a plant, have vacuoles that are filled with unpleasant compounds that discourage animals from eating it. Some of these unpleasant compounds include tannins, which are a group of molecules that taste very unpleasantly bitter. Drug-producing plants, like coca or the coffee bean, will accumulate the drug compound in their vacuoles. The compound that's stored in a particular cell's vacuole can also play a role in that cell's function, or specialization. All cells are specialized like this in some way. 
Groups of cells share a similar specialization, to become tissues. Tissues then compose the organs and the flesh of an organism. All cells also have a variable structure and a variable proportion of organelles that depends on their function. All of these different traits and qualities of the cells really depends on their function and where in the body they, they grow and what they're evolved to do. Muscles, for example, have very long fibrous cells filled with parallel protein filaments. The protein filaments crawl past one another when the cell contracts. And when many muscle cells contract at once, the muscle tissue itself contracts and limb movement is initiated. This contraction requires a ton of energy. So to power all of this movement, muscle cells have a relatively high number of mitochondria. Similarly, the parietal cells in your stomach are also full of mitochondria. These parietal cells in your stomach lining are the guys responsible for producing your stomach acid. Producing stomach acid is a pretty energy expensive process, so having more mitochondria ultimately makes for a more productive parietal cell. Consider the hormone producing cells in the gonads namely the Leydig cells and the granulosa cells. These cells use cholesterol molecules as precursors for other steroid hormones. To be more specific, the Leydig cells in the testicles produce testosterone, and the granulosa cells in the ovary produce estrogen. Both of these types of cells process a high quantity of lipids in the form of steroid hormones. As lipids are processed in the smooth ER, the Leydig and granulosa cells have a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The body has endless examples of cells whose form facilitates their function. I mean, consider your neurons, whose long axons and branching dendrites allow hundreds of neurons to connect together, which enables you to think complex thoughts and reflect on your existence. Consider the lining of your intestines. Enterocytes develop thousands of microvilli along their apical sides. These microvilli are like thin tendrils, and together they increase the surface area of the enterocyte tremendously, which allows it to absorb more nutrients. Consider the cells that produce the mucus in your nose, with their goblet-like structures, or the cells in your eye, with their light-absorbing pigments, or the thin, slippery cells lining the inside of your veins. All cells have some kind of specialization. When large groups of cells all have the same specialization, they form tissues and organs. These tissues and these organs do the things that living organisms need in order to survive. Your muscle tissue moves your limbs by applying forces to your skeletal tissue. Your neural tissue is responsible for both conscious thought and the unconscious regulation of body systems like your heart rate, your body temperature, and the depth of your respiration. Your dermal tissue acts like a hairy spacesuit to keep out pathogens and protect your soft innards from ultraviolet radiation. There's really endless examples of this. I could go on, but for your sake, I'm just going to wrap it up here. That is about it for this episode. I think this was a pretty basic introduction to the cell. You know, it didn't get too complex, but it went over a lot of the basics. Hopefully all of you listening thought it was a pretty decent explanation, and hopefully you learned something cool. So this is the first episode in a series covering the cell and its functions. Next episode, I'll be discussing the subsystems of the cell. I talked about the subsystems briefly, just in a general sense in this episode, but in the next episode, I'll be going into much more detail in stuff like the internal transport mechanisms and the growth and expansion of the cytoskeleton. So if any of that sounds cool and interesting, then be sure to come by and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening.